No one said launching a game would be easy. In fact, many people said that launching my debut game, Mike Simulator 2020, would be extremely difficult. And they were right. But some game launches are easier than others, while some are more troubled than Cyberpunk 2077's brooding rocker boy Johnny Silverhand. Wound up here, locked in this room. Laid in bed, staring at the ceiling fan for a good month. Only I can fix him. With the memory of Cyberpunk 2077 coming out all glitchy and under-optimised, still as sharp as a cyborg arm blade, we wonder whether this ambitious, much-hyped title stands a chance of shaking off its notoriously messy launch. Especially given how launch drama tends to stick to a game's reputation. Just consider these seven variously disastrous launches that aren't easily forgotten, and beware spoilers for these following games. I think making a video game about professional wrestling would be easy. After all, wrestling is already pretty much a video game with its over-the-top characters and special moves and evil undead wizards. So while expectations weren't exactly sky-high for the most recent entry in World Wrestling Entertainment's WWE 2K series, WWE 2K20, fans were still expecting a solid wrestling sim that would let them live out their dream of seeing Stone Cold Steve Austin and Hulk Hogan get into a fistfight at a black tie buffet. Hey brother. What's happening? Brother? However, behind the scenes, a new studio was in charge of development and by most accounts was having a pretty rough time of it. WWE 2K20 was the first game in the series not developed by veteran studio Ukes, instead being primarily developed by Visual Concepts, the US studio responsible for 2K's NBA games. Basketball, you'll notice, doesn't have much in common with pro wrestling. I guess they're all on the tall side? The upshot of this developer switch and rush to release is that almost as soon as it came out, the game went viral and not for the reason the developers would hope. Instead, it became clear at launch that the game was riddled with hilarious, memeable bugs that involved people glitching through ropes, wrestlers waddling around on their knees, and hair that not so much defied physics as it did shoot physics in the head and bury it in the woods. Soul patch is inside <laughs> his mouth. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> What followed was weeks of annoyed and disappointed players taking the lead from Visual Concept's previous games and dunking on WWE 2K20 with memes, glitch compilations, and enormous Reddit threads detailing all the things wrong with the game. Word of mouth was obviously terrible, so sales suffered, and it was later announced that WWE 2K20's launch was so disastrous that WWE 2K21 was cancelled. It was replaced with the much more basic and arcadey WWE Battlegrounds, which came out in September 2020 and at least let you feed other wrestlers to an alligator, so that's something. Time will tell if the WWE 2K series can get back on track after this disastrous launch, but one thing is for sure, previous developer Ukes ain't coming back. They've now partnered with rival wrestling company All Elite Wrestling to produce their first video game, announced in a press conference where everyone was cosplaying as Steve Jobs because pro wrestling. Looking forward to their E3 presentation where one of the developers gets powerbombed through a flaming table by Brock Lesnar in revenge. How we wanted Star Wars Battlefront 2 to succeed when it landed in late 2017. How we hoped it would fully deliver on the potential of 2015's Battlefront 1, with its promise of expanded multiplayer modes and a bigger roster of iconic Star Wars heroes and villains. Roger, Roger. Unlike the game before it, Battlefront 2 had the single-player story campaign we craved, starring Imperial Commander Aiden Verzio, who may or may not have the heart of a hero and may or may not join the Rebel Alliance. Spoiler alert, she has and does. Agent Hask, do you read me? Loud and clear, Commander Versio. But if that was the least astonishing thing revealed with the release of Battlefront 2, the most astonishing thing was how you would have to grind through some 40-odd hours of multiplayer to unlock playable Darth Vader. These are the fruits of treason. <laughs> 
and yet the inaccessibility of your boy DV and the other special characters that publisher EA had touted heavily was but one aspect of Battlefront 2's launch troubles. Even before the game was in the hands of the general public, it had gotten a high-profile dressing down from those who had tried Battlefront 2 multiplayer in pre-release and noted that its loot box-based monetization would be, in a word, a catastrophe. It turns out that a system where randomized loot crates confer in-game advantages and can be bought with real money is wildly unpopular with everyone except those who stand to make money from it, especially when multiplayer progression unaided by microtransactions would be slower than a Sarlax digestive system. I'm going for it. Woo! <laughs> you just, nom, 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 you nom. just belly flopped into it. That turned out to be the case so hard that EA actually disabled microtransactions in the game on the day before launch. Troops. But too bad for Battlefront, the damage had already been done. Even with some remedial tinkering on the game's multiplayer progression, the controversy blew up more spectacularly than a Death Star with a detonated reactor core. For EA, this negativity around the launch of Battlefront 2 brought on missed sales targets, $3 billion of lost stock value, and according to reports, unhappy executives at Star Wars owning entertainment monolith Disney. She is here. Unfocused power. Eventually, the game did confine loot crates and microtransactions to just cosmetic items, decoupling them from other unlockable rewards, and in fact, unlocking all heroes and vehicles for all players. But the infamy of that fraught launch lives on, like a really persistent force ghost, and that's all the Star Wars similes for today. Patients saying that the symptoms to watch for are aggression, foaming from the mouth, deterioration of motor skills, and an unbelievable hunger. Be advised that if an infected becomes hostile, the only way to harm them is to shoot them in the head. In modern society, we have rules against misrepresenting the thing you're promoting. Whether that's official laws against false advertising, or just the fact that I'm not allowed to describe myself on Tinder as a six foot two brain surgeon with baby soft hands, apparently. The War Z is one title that fell foul of this societal accord. If you recall, back in 2012, Daisy was a wildly popular zombie mod with a huge community, but no actual standalone game. Banking on people's willingness to buy anything with the letter Z in the title, developer Hammerpoint released the suspiciously similar The War Z, also an open world zombie survival shooter. A flawless plan. If it hadn't launched with a Steam description page that was the wildest piece of fiction since that M. Night Shyamalan movie where Mark Wahlberg battles murderous pot plants. Among the features falsely claimed to be included in The War Z were multiple maps of between 100 and 400 square kilometers in size, the option to set up private servers, and the ability to play with up to 100 people in a game at any one time. Back in the tedious realms of reality where the rest of us are forced to live, the game actually had a single 72 kilometer square map, no private servers, and a 50 player cap. Hey, at least they managed to find time to put the zombies in. Judging by the rest of the game, it was probably touch and go for a bit there. All this might have been less of an issue had the game not immediately shot to the top of the Steam sales charts off the back of its similarities with DayZ, subjecting it to a lot of scrutiny. Also, if one of the developers hadn't accused people of misreading the Steam page. As my grandma always used to say, when you're already in a 50 foot deep blast crater, stop digging. That was only the start of the War Z's problems. First, people discovered that items you paid for via microtransactions could be lost forever when you died, which the developer claimed the fans loved. Then, the game was pulled from Steam entirely and refunds offered to everyone unfortunate enough to buy it. Then, only six months after launch, the US Patent and Trademark Office suspended the trademark for the name The War Z because of its obvious similarities to upcoming Paramount Pictures movie World War Z forcing them to rename the game Infestation Survivor Stories. Damn, hope this doesn't affect the nine movie sci-fi epic I have planned. Working title, A Star War. Everything all right, sir? Fine, Corporal. Superb shot. 
Regular drills are critical to a regiment's success. We should be going, sir. We part ways here. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag was basically the perfect Assassin's Creed game in that it was mostly you being a pirate and occasionally you had to do some light clerical work for a Montreal tech company. Ah, ar, yar, matey. <laughs> Very exciting. Welcome aboard. As such, the next main Assassin's Creed game needed to be something special if the series was to keep up its impressive momentum. And early signs were good. The setting, the French Revolution, was an evocative one, and early trailers and demos showed new character Arno Dorian cutting a dashing figure as he took part in famous events, rubbed shoulders with historical figures, and of course, clambered all over Notre Dame Cathedral. From the top, you can see the city of Paris spread out as far as the eye can see. Paris is the biggest, densest, and most immersive city we've ever created. As you can tell, Assassin's Creed Unity was an ambitious game, especially as it was to be the first Assassin's Creed game for a new generation of consoles, which placed even more pressure on the developers to get things right. Considering that we're talking about it in this video, however, you can probably guess that things didn't go that way. In fact, it was quite the opposite, as Ubisoft's dreams for Unity came crashing down to Earth like a careless assassin without a bale of hay to break their fall. For one thing, Ubisoft set the review embargo for Assassin's Creed Unity to lift a full 12 hours after the game had gone on sale, and once it did, it quickly became apparent that the launch version of the game was riddled with bugs, including, but not limited to, frame rate issues, main character Arno falling through the floor, and HOLY sh the fact that Ubisoft had not allowed the press to tell people about the bugs before launch is what really got a lot of people's goats, with angry gamers claiming that Ubisoft had tried to hide the state of the game from their customers. As a result, the game received mediocre reviews, Ubisoft shares dipped a whopping 12.8%, and the company was forced to issue a statement saying that they would be more transparent in future to avoid a repeat of STOP DOING THAT! Hearing that a developer is creating a game set in a giant universe filled with 18 quintillion planets when its previous three games were about a cutesy motorcycle stuntman is a bit like finding out that prior to the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo had only ever done rude cartoon greetings cards. Still, back in 2013, when Hello Games revealed that its follow-up to Joe Danger 2 the movie was No Man's Sky, it instantly became known as one of the most ambitious video game projects of all time. We've had so much positivity about the game, you know, like you just never see that, where, where people really get behind something in such a big way. If No Man's Sky was successful, it would sit alongside other titanic game development feats, like simulating complex evolution in Spore, condensing all of human history into the Civilization games, and just getting Duke Nukem Forever out the door before everyone involved died of old age. Did you think I was gone forever? I mean, I had hoped. No Man's Sky arrived in 2016 with the requisite number of planets, sure, but there were several important features missing at launch that had been sort of a little bit promised in the lead up to its release. But that is a journey that they will undertake and to do that they will need to upgrade their ship, upgrade their weapons, uh, upgrade their suit, um, and they will need to plan and they will need to cooperate with other players to an extent. In particular, the game was lacking competing factions, the large-scale space battles we'd seen in trailers and functioning multiplayer. <music> Though hold on, I'm also not sure I ever actually counted those 18 quintillion planets. Be right back. Okay, yep, they're all there. Phew. Such was the disgruntlement at these missing features that in the UK, the Advertising Standards Authority opened an investigation against No Man's Sky. Although it did eventually rule that the game's Steam page had not misled consumers, it was just one more piece of bad news around the game's launch. The backlash from some players to No Man's Sky was extreme and got pretty ugly, but rather than simply taking the money, cutting the game loose and entering some sort of witness protection program, Hello Games continued to work on the game and added many of these missing features in a series of transformative updates.
Then, Hello Games went on to add an almost sarcastic number of additional features that had never been previously promised, including virtual reality support, base building, and more recently, a version for Xbox Series X and PS5, consoles that were released four years after the game was. No Man's Sky will never successfully shake the memory of its disappointing launch, but the result is a game that as it stands today has more of everything. More diverse worlds, more features, more storyline, and apparently, oh great, even more planets. Brilliant, now I have to start over. One, two, th no, wait, that's a moon. from Atari, made especially for systems from Atari, the video game that lets you help E.T. get home. Disastrous video game launches aren't just a modern phenomenon. For perhaps the most notorious video game launch in history, we have to look back to 1982 and the launch of E.T. the Extraterrestrial for the Atari 2600. E.T. the movie was a huge hit that summer, and as a result, Atari went all in trying to get the license to make a video game based on it. Several months and $25 million in licensing fees later, they acquired that license, but they only had five weeks in which to actually develop the game in order to meet the deadline to get it on shop shelves by Christmas. Just in time for Christmas. Happy Holidays from Atari. So they did what any game developer in a tight spot would do. Made one guy do it all on his own. The result, when it launched, as you can probably imagine, was not what you would call a good game, or even really a game, seeing as all you did was walk this vaguely ET-shaped thing around, falling into holes over and over again, hoping to find vaguely telephone-shaped things in order to get this magnificent ending, where this vaguely Elliot-shaped thing does a lap of his house. The game was a sales disaster, which was a problem for Atari, as it had kind of banked on it selling 5 million copies on the strength of the E.T. license alone. When those sales failed to materialise, it kicked off the subsequent video game crash that almost destroyed the industry. Atari reported a $536 million loss in 1983, and it basically killed off the Atari 2600 as a home console. It also famously led to Atari having to encase millions of video game cartridges in concrete and bury them in the New Mexico desert. I did a little program that I wrote 32 years ago, and today it is still generating social discourse, media, entertainment, focus. It's all happening, right? So, so the fact that something I did that long ago is still creating this much interest, that just makes me feel good. The fact that they're treating it like a whacked Mafia rival should tell you everything you need to know about how this launch went. 300 years after our great nation began, we gather together to honor the completion of Vault 76. Released in 2018, Fallout 76 maintained the Fallout tradition of taking an old-timey song and making it bleakly ironic. Country roads, take me It did not, however, maintain the Fallout tradition of being a satisfying single-player RPG experience, on account of being neither single-player nor satisfying. Fallout 76 was and is a multiplayer online open-world game set in the Fallout universe generally and in West Virginia specifically, hence the song. West Virginia. Exactly. When it released in November 2018, it already faced an uphill battle to please Fallout fans given the lack of a single player mode for those Vault survivors who hungered for a solo experience. From there, the going only got tougher, as reviewers declared the Appalachian Wasteland was not only, quote, boring and soulless, but also swarming with bugs, and not the fun kind that want to sting you to death and lay eggs in your irradiated corpse. Even back then, the game had its loyal defenders, but nonetheless players had to contend with technical bugs, and occasionally other players exploiting those technical bugs, which isn't what anyone wants from their Fallout experience. 
Layer that on top of the total lack at launch of any human non-player characters to bring the story of Vault 76 to life, and you're looking at some pretty peeved early adopters. It's been so long since I've had a customer. Targets are shredded again. The early proliferation of eye-wateringly expensive cosmetic items for sale in the in-game store didn't make Fallout 76 any friends either. Not when there was a virtual Santa suit on sale for more real-world money than an actual physical Santa suit that you could at least wear to an actual physical Christmas party. Since launch, the game has had its ups and downs with updates here and a premium subscription offering there, but now, two years since release, Fallout 76 has done its damnedest to claw back goodwill by improving performance, rebalancing enemies, and saints be praised, giving us some human characters to talk to. Honey. You picked the wrong time to get a drink. Not to mention how, late last year, the Brotherhood of Steel rolled into town in free expansion Steel Dawn. It took so much to get here. We can't fall apart now that we finally made it. But much like the earworm that is John Denver's Country Roads, the awkward post-launch period of Fallout 76 is all but impossible to get out of your head. Life is all there, older than the trees, younger than the mountains, blowing like the breeze. Country Roads, take me home. Whoa, whoa, you're still here. That's great. Um, thank you for watching this video. Please do like and subscribe and hit the little bell icon to be notified of future videos which I promise will contain less of my singing. In fact, if you'd like to just scoot on over to one of the videos that's on screen now and we'll forget this ever happened, that would be great. Thanks for watching. Bye!